I'm Mari Robles, the new executive director at Headlands, and I'm excited to welcome you to today's conversation with artists who were commissioned to create new guides for the Key Room as part of our year-end fundraising campaign. For those of you who are not familiar with the Key Room, I'm in it now, and I want to briefly introduce the space. So the Key Room officially was unlocked in 2016. It is a multifaceted multimedia project created by artist Carrie Hot. Carrie, are, are you with us? If you are, can you unmute yourself for just a second and say hello? Not yet? Okay. Well, Carrie will be joining us. Um, uh, Carrie is a, was a former artist in resident in 2014. I'll keep going. <laughs> um, in 2014, and a current board member. Um, the permanent art installation um, that Carrie created also serves as a visitor resource center on the first floor of Headlands main campus. So in this project, Carrie incorporates extensive research on the history of in Headlands from the Portuguese immigrant dairy farmers who lived in the area through the 19th century, to the military personnel, to citizen activists, to the park service, and finally to the visionary artists and thought leaders who started Headlands uh, in the early 80s. So with these stories in mind, the key room embraces um, a display style that is relevant to the site, and it has archival holdings, military operation room, uh, archaeological displays, and visitor center for historical interpretation. So as I mentioned, the key room features artists created maps that serve as self-guided explorations of headlands. And today we're here to talk about three of our newest maps. Here to introduce our panel of artists is educator, artist, and headlands alumni, Walter Katunde. Katundu, apologies. Um, he, he was here in 2008 and currently lives in Chicago. He creates kinetic sculptures and sonic installations, develops public works, builds and performs extraordinary musical instruments, all while studying and documenting the natural world. His map, Lagoon Encounters, was created for the opening of the Key Room. So I'm really excited to join to welcome Walter and the rest of the panel. And Walter, please join me in welcoming um, just saying. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Mari. Hi, everyone. Um, it's really nice to be here in community with all of you to talk a about a place that's so dear to so many of us. Um, we're going to kick things off by hearing a bit from each artist about their map, followed by an opportunity to take questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please use the chat button at the bottom of your screen anytime to send the question to me, and I'll try to keep uh, tabs on my end. And I hope to be able to get to all of your questions, but we'll do the best that we can. Um, another question. To you. Please make sure that you're muted so we can cut down on the background noise. And um, feel free to also choose the speaker view uh, option in Zoom to best see the person who's speaking at any given time. Uh, as Madi mentioned, uh, the map that I created, Lagoon Encounters, was one of the original guides that was commissioned for the opening of the key room. I think we're going to share that with you now. And my, the process of developing this map for me predated the request from Carrie to create it. It was already being formed by, by the wide array of experiences that I had during my time in the headlands, both as an artist in residence um, and as a bird watcher and a raptor researcher with the Golden Gate Raptor Observatory, which is also based in the headlands. I had been making a, a mental map of all of the places that I'd seen good birds or had remarkable wildlife experiences. So it's, it's just part of how I move through the landscape and learn from it. I can't move through a space in which I've seen an owl, for example, uh, and not look at that perch every single time that I pass by. So just on the off chance that there might be an owl there again. So th those experiences become how I register and understand a place. In my map, I wanted to I wanted to present it in such a way that it shows that these experiences aren't necessarily linear. There's no three-step method to owl and bobcat encounters. You just have to kind of be there and be in those moments. Um, and there's a couple of approaches that I take when I'm spending time in places like the lagoon. Uh, one is to be calm and open and to see what's there rather than what I expect to see. Um, 
this sounds very simple, but it's actually really challenging because our ex expectations are built on our past experience, which is really helpful in many cases. But um, those expectations that we have can easily override our, um, our reality. Uh, for example, one time I was in the city and in San Francisco and I tried to point out a hawk to somebody that was walking by. The hawk was sitting on a branch about four feet above their heads. And they immediately began searching the sky and trying to get me to tell them where, where the hawk was. So um, their expectation had calibrated their vision so that they could easily miss a large bird of prey, which happened to be almost within arm's reach. My five-year-old daughter, Azadeh, she, she teaches me how to look without expectation um, because she just sees what's there. Uh, and this is more of like a daily practice for me. It's, it's, it's not something that I can say that I've accomplished, but it's one method that I use when I'm in natural spaces to try to reconnect and be grounded. Um, the other one is focusing on one species and then having them be the guide to the landscape. One of the things that I often say is that birds are the best bird watchers and that's because their lives depend on being fully present, um, being aware of all the activity that's around them. So if you stick with one bird or with the otters or with raccoons, they will teach you about the land. They'll teach you about what's important. They'll teach you about what's edible. They'll teach you about the light, about the wind. So that's the approach that I tend to take more so is to stick with one being and then um, just try to listen and learn from them as much as possible. So the map is a result of essentially being taught what a lagoon is by the lagoon itself. Um, and it's my document of, of that process. Uh, as a, just to, to refer to a couple of stories that are in the map, as a photographer, I suffer from this condition that I call light denial. I'll stay it out well beyond the, the time that the light has faded and it doesn't make sense to try to take pictures anymore. And I happened to be doing that when I came across this raccoon who over the course of about 40 minutes, I watched it go from object to object, testing things. And I thought maybe it was looking for something to eat, but it turns out it was testing them for buoyancy. And then it selected a kelp float and tucked the kelp float under its arm and used it as a swimming aid to swim across the lagoon. So um, just a quiet and probably very common example of tool use among these very intelligent beings. Um, and also in the headlands, I was also captivated by this family of river otters that arrived one day and began to prey on the countless birds that had been taking refuge on the lagoon for years. I had seen a lot of evidence of their hunts, but I started to actually see them hunting as well. And uh, including one incident that's marked on the map when they quietly submerged and closed the distance to a great blue heron that was on the shore um, and then burst out of the water only to just miss it as they lunged to try to attack the bird. So um, those things stay in your mind and sort of stay in your heart and memories of a place. And they've built up my sense of what the headlands was. And that's what I've tried to put into the map. Um, one lesson that I've learned and that I hope the map can be a tool to help people realize is that nature is always spectacular. It's always ready to be spectacular. So early on, I used to think that I was missing out if I wasn't out at first light or if I couldn't get out on a particular day, but it's always open to the demands of the, of the moment. So remarkable things can happen anytime. Um, you could be out there for three hours before you see something, or it could be within seconds of you getting out of a car. So. The map was really a collection of years of experiences, but they are available to anyone who is willing to be uh, present and to listen. And the map was also about reflecting on my relationship with the headlands, finding a way to share it, um, I hoped would provide a glimpse into what a dynamic and surprising place that it can be. Uh, the drawings are all from photographs that I've taken during my walks there. It's a very personal map, but there's no reason why anybody who chose to spend time on the trail or by the water wouldn't also get to know the place in a similarly rich way. So it points to the past, but it's a collection of my memories, but it's meant as a guide to what is possible um, and what's currently happening in the headlands. So now I'd like to introduce uh, Ellie Irons. Uh, Ellie is an interdisciplinary artist and an educator based in New York. She works in a variety of media from walks to Wi-Fi to gardening to reveal how human and non-human lives intertwine with other earth systems. Ellie has participated in both climate change and climate change equity thematic residency programs at the Headlands. 
her map, uh, Vegetal Generations, encourages us to observe the terrain and the living soil we walk upon, to meditate on the generations of beings that have moved through this land. Uh, the journey is an invitation to slow down, pause, breathe, and tune into seed time. So Ellie, what do you hope those who engage with your map will take away from the experience? Uh, thank you, Walter, for that question. And thanks, uh, Mari, also um, for the introduction. And I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm actually coming to you from uh, Troy, New York on Mohican land and I'm looking at snow outside my window. So seeing the sunlight um, streaming in on the California morning is taking me <laughs> out there. I really, I miss it. Um, but to, to get back to the um, initial question, um, if you've spent time with the map already, you may know the answer to this, but literally I am interested in the possibility of the participant um, or anyone who engages with the map in a physical sense at the headlands um, being confronted with the possibility of taking away a seed, literally. Um, the map guides you through a, a series of 10 um, locations and at the end it asks you to um, sit down on a rock and look back at the path you've taken and then inspect the soles of your shoes and your pant legs and your socks and see if anything has hitched a ride. And I'm interested in um, posing that question because I hope that it can bring up um, one of the central themes that is present throughout the map, which is this kind of um, reckoning with human complicity in terms of the way that we um, do or don't engage with more than human nature. So you might be looking at this seed in the palm of your hand and saying, huh, I don't know what kind of seed this is. I don't know where it wants to go. I don't know if it would be right for me to drop it here or to put it in the trash or to rewild it somewhere. Um, so I'm hoping some of those questions will arise. Um, this map for me, kind of similar to what you were talking about, Walter, um, is a walk that anyone could take, but that's framed through, well, not anyone. I mean, it do require a certain um, degree of ableness. We should acknowledge that in, in many of these maps that ask us to move on to um, these kinds of paths and terrain. Um, but hopefully also you can get somewhere just by reading the map. I'm, I, I thought of that as a possibility that people who wouldn't necessarily be traveling on these routes physically might be transported through the text and the images. Um, but to get back to, to my lens rather than um, owls or otters, I, I chose a very specific lens of wild and weedy plants. And this is a walk that I took um, sometimes multiple times per day when I was at the headlands um, for these two climate change residencies that I participated in, which were amazing events um, that brought together artists, scientists, people from the social sciences, community organizers and activists, and granted um, a lot of ideas flying at you all the time. So I would take these breaks and walk this short um, path up to an overlook above the headlands um, and kind of, or above the the campus and look back down. And um, the, the map is really kind of an attempt to pull together experiences I had over multiple of those walks. And I did it in retrospect um, from the East Coast, looking back at my journals and my photographs and asking for um, ways of being in touch with the landscape that ask you to actually physically engage with often overlooked organisms, wild and weedy plants. And um, I think kind of the way that Walter was framing um, the beings that he was following or um, noticing as teachers, I'm also thinking about plants as teachers um, and acknowledging the long history of indigenous cosmologies who have known with an unbroken <laughs> chain from um, 10,000 years ago in the case of the headlands um, to today that plants are teachers and that we're in a reciprocal entangled um, life with them. So I'm hoping that there's these small little moments in the map that ask you to, you know, sit down on a decaying basketball court and contemplate a thistle and think about where its roots and its seeds might grow, um, that those offer opportunities to begin to maybe in a more metaphorical sense, to give you a seed to take away um, that will help um, with the, 
the really um, intense and necessary work of dismantling Cartesian dualities between um, the so-called natural world and the human world, um, which I think is something that I feel we have some hope with in terms of the, um, what happened yesterday and a lot of rollbacks happening um, around some really disastrous environmental policy, but that we need a lot more work with and, and places like the headlands that are bringing together artists and scientists and people working across disciplines are, are essential to that. So um, yeah, that's, that's a quick introduction. Yeah, brilliant and very, very full answer. Thank you. Um, all right, let's uh, move on to Yatunde. I wanted to introduce uh, Yatunde, who's an artist, a maker, and, a, and currently residing in Oakland, California. They utilize video, sculpture, action, and gesture, and performance as through lines for inquiry regarding Black labor, legacy, and the processes of healing. Uh, they are rooted in the need to understand history, the people that made it, the myths surrounding them, and how their own body is implicated in history's timeline. Yatunde's uh, Olabaju's A Map of Anything holds a space for us to look at the headlands and its surroundings and, and to share our own perspectives, our own memories, our own feelings. Different scenes from the Marin headlands are paired with questions uh, to guide you in your own navigation. Yatunde, I wanted to maybe start you off with this question. Uh, why is it important that your mapping explores the relationship between our internal and external landscape? Yeah. Um, so for me, uh, I had actually approached this in a bunch of different ways, starting off like I um, had really wanted to make this very highly curated experience and flow for folks. But I also, after sitting with it um, and really um, connecting my body to the way that headwinds makes me feel, I realize and want to acknowledge that everybody has a different experience coming to this place and everybody is bringing their own um, memory, nostalgia, sense of um, embodiment into this place when going to it. Um, and so I was really thinking about how we can both honor what's going on internally within us, be present with that internality um, and how we can turn that same sensibility of quiet observation or maybe about observation if you want, um, but quiet observation in this um, ex uh, example to uh, the landscape and find ways to um, connect our uh, emotions to um, these features within the headlands and thus making a whole new set of memories and nostalgia. Um, originally I was thinking about having this be really diaristic, which I think it still is um, in some aspects, but um, very um, narrative based on my personal narrative and a little bit um, divul like divulging certain aspects of uh, my practice of trying to practice being embodied. I have a really hard time um, and I'm working on this. I have a hard time um, uh, knowing what the thing feels like in my body. I'm really good at thinking it through. I'm really good at logicking my way in and out of experience, um, but I think the thing that I really appreciate about headlands is when I go, I'm reminded that I have a body and that is, is um, forced upon me in the way in which the, the landscape sort of receives me. Um, and sort of the, pil the pilgrimage from, I'm coming from Oakland. And so it's like an hour uh, by myself in the car um, to and from the headlands. And, and so I really wanted to be able to provide that, that space for people and not be so, um, uh, rigid about the expectations I have of other people's way of uh, experience the landscape and moving through it. Um, I wanted to leave space for people to, um, to explore. And so, yeah, I um, wanted to guide people through feelings of transition, um, feelings of discomfort and struggle, um, cycles, um, I took a photo of headlands because I'm really practicing on being committed to being in the studio and creating a discipline around that um, and creating a routine around that. And so really um, wanting to, again, curate this uh, experience of what I was thinking about at these specific landscapes, but also opening it up so that other people can 
um, memorialize and sort of canonize their own experience. Um, yeah, that was yeah. meant. Yeah. Yeah, those photographs that you took are really, um, they feel like almost iconic moments mm. and places within the headlands um yeah. and it's 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 interesting that that not only your personal points of contact with the space but they are they have a kind of universality like the the tunnel and the beach and the other spaces that really lead you to um take a moment to reflect your 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 comment about traveling all the way from, from oakland was um i i felt that because when i lived in the city you kind of need a rescaling and a recontextualizing every so often. And the Headlands does really remind you of your scale in, in the mm -hmm. environment in a way that's very healthy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, I'd like to introduce Connie Jung, uh, a Chinese born artist, writer, and filmmaker currently based out of Oakland and pursuing her PhD at UC Santa Cruz. She works across text, drawing, painting, installation, and time-based media. Uh, she works, um, her work is driven by an interest in exploring uh, diasporic memory, ecological elegy, um, and divergent articulations of hope from an environmental justice perspective as told through visual and text-based forms. Um, Connie's A Fog Bath and Seed Search in Three Parts is an invitation to walk the Marin Headlands to pay closer attention to the plants along the way, to imagine layers of history that form that space and to envelop ourselves in the magical and mysterious headlands fog, uh, which is a celebrity in its own right. Um, Connie, how did you approach the relationship between text and images in your lovely map? Like, can you talk about the cartog uh, cartographic possibilities uh, of both the written and the visual? Sorry, I had to unmute. Um, no worries. Thank you so much. And, uh, and I, I also just want to start by saying, um, I'm, yeah, I'm really resonating with what everyone is um, sharing. And I, I'm a huge fan of the work of everyone on this panel with. So it's, uh, it's an honor. Um, yeah, so when I was thinking about uh, sort of the cartographic here, I was um, I mean, I, I tended to take the same walk every time I was in the headlands because I, um, I'm very directionally challenged. Actually, I have a really, I get lost very easily and I didn't want to be on my phone constantly trying to track my own movements to make sure I didn't get lost um, before sundown. So I, I kind of had this route that I really like to take. And, um, and so, I mean, I'm someone who understands space through particular visual markers and relationships rather than um, a grid or a set of directions. And, and so that was sort of um, like a, a guiding, like a, a yeah, like a, um, a sort of grounding element for me to just think about when making this was to think about what kinds of relationships I was interested in um, and which spoke to me as I was moving through the space and also what kind of transformations were happening um, and so, yeah, I think when I think about maps and map making, I mean, I'm not a cartographer, obviously, and, um, but I, I am really interested in history and um, especially colonial and imperialist, imperialist histories of the space. And, um, and I do think like the practice of map making has often been, you know, used for purposes of resource management and, um, and, and extraction. And so I'm really invested in like in place, in body-based ways of knowing a space um, and, and also recognizing our own limits of knowing a place. Um, I, I resonate with, you know, what everyone is saying around the sort of like magic of the headlands and so like how dynamic the space is. And I, and I, and I, I really approach um, like text and drawing as different ways of um, understanding. So yeah, and so like that relationship was sort of what I was, was drawing upon while, while working on this. Um, I do think that there are certain kinds of knowledge that really can be only experienced through the body and can be communicated only through movement or drawing or sound or 
um, writing and and so yeah I think like text and drawing for me are different ways to try to tap into this embodied experience of accessing space and um, they both sort of link into these different languages and histories and semiotic systems and so for me I really think about text as a way of making sense and um, creating or unearthing narrative. And I think about images as a way to find um, or to locate connections, uh, relationships and networks. And I really, um, uh, I feel like, yeah, like one of my favorite um, articulations of drawing as a practice is uh, from John Berger, um, where he talks about drawing as an encounter. So, um, you know, like here, I was thinking, like when I was working on these drawings, I was, I was really trying to think about like, like through the drawings, I was trying to access this, the experience of like encountering, um, like the, you know, some of these abandoned batteries or encountering deer or encountering the experience of climbing up certain rocks, um, of moving through the fog. And um, yeah, and so in this, this map, I was like the, the map, or sorry, the fog sort of figures as like a kind of physical metaphor um, for liminality on, and the omnipresence of like ghosts and hauntings. Um, I, I spent a lot of like most, like my headland schedule was sort of like, I would get there in the afternoon and, uh, and then I'd stay until night. And so I was always there for the dusk. And dusk is when the fog rises like in this really intense way. Um, like it really, like I always thought it looked like and felt like ghosts kind of coming out of, of the landscape. And, um, and so that was something that I wanted to try to access while working on this. Thank you. Um, I'd like to open it up now. Uh open up the discussion so please if you if you'd like please make sure you enter your questions into the chat so that we can get them asked of everybody um, we already have one um, from uh, Stephen he'd like to hear Yetunde's description of a few of uh, of your photographs sure um, can can somebody pull it up for me we okay. reshare that yeah please thanks for the question Stephen um, I know the first one is the tunnel and the tunnel always feels like I am every time I go through that tunnel I'm like cool I'm going to a totally completely new place um, and it feels like a real moment of arriving I also really associate like um, something that I've been doing in the middle of COVID is um, reading about people's near-death experiences and experiences with death and transition um, and so hence this question of um, anything you feel about transitions, death or rebirth. Um, and I associate that tunnel very much so with my, um, my internal landscape, my thoughts, my feelings are about to change. I'm about to arrive at this place. And it's both celebratory and also a death. It's also a mourning, I think, um, uh, of, of acknowledging that transition that happens within that tunnel. Um, and there's also pageantry around it, you know, like you have to wait five minutes on either end. It feels like really like honoring people's movements um, just by being at that tunnel, whether on a bike or in the car. Um, the other uh, photograph is when you are driving. A lot of these are accessible via the car because, again, I was thinking about my pilgrimage to and from the headlands. Um, and so this one is um, a uh, a rock face that you can see both from headlands and it, I like how you can change perspectives and see this one spot but it's right before you get to the beach um, and I just love the colors of it the textures of it and it always felt like a sort of um, a stopping point or a um, bless you <laughs> a stopping point or a um, I don't know uh, a sort of marker uh, again another like uh, indicator that you are moving through the space. And um, it always, I always think about like climbing it and how much effort it would take me to climb it. Cause there is, um, you can tell that there's something on the other side of, of that. And I think it's a continuing um, uh, uh, trail. 
but I think about climbing it and I think about my levels of comfort when approaching it. I also think about there's inside of that wall, there's like a divot almost that's like person size relatively. And I think about what it would feel like um, to like crawl into that space and, and, and try and make comfort for yourself. Um, so yeah, that's that second photo. That third photo I think is a flipped photo of when you walk up um, from Rodeo Beach, that that really tall part that's right above the 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 beach, and you can see all the surfers. And I I often like will walk up there and try and get somebody to like see me waving at them. So it feels a lot about like um, I don't know, like it feels like a celebratory place. And so I think about um, celebrating while being in a body, while being close to this. Um, to this moving, continually moving body of water, to be able to witness other people in engage with the water. Um, and so that feels like a really special place to me. And then typically like I'll, I'll do that drive and then I'll loop back over to, to Headlands and then I'll really get into it. I'll be like, okay, like what do I need to do? What, is my, what are my to-do lists? What do I want to accomplish here? Uh, how do I want to challenge myself while I'm in the actual studio? Um, Sorry, uh, and um, and how do I want to practice that and have it be a discipline that I'm cultivating within myself that doesn't feel um, doesn't feel like it's not honoring who I already am or who I've become in this very short journey. Um, and so, yeah, the the archways of the headlands sometimes when it's blocking out the light and it's it looks a little ominous, but it also looks like something to um, to commit to and to be present with. And so then this is the view of the lagoon when you're swinging around behind headlands on the other side. I forget the name of that street, but it's right past all of the, um, the hostel buildings and all of the other uh, headland buildings that are for long-term stays. Um, and it has a really, I have a habit of taking, every time I go to the headlands, taking a photo um, on that road of the lagoon. And again, it just feels like, um, once you get up to that point, your your total your entire perspective of that journey that you just took, you can see every point um, from every point in my map. You can see encompassed in that one last photo. And so I asked about perspective, memory, and healing, and thinking about ways in which we how our perspective changes if it's um, if it's opening up a new possibility for us. Um, yes, I love your lagoon picture, Walter. <laughs> Um, and yeah, I'm, I can't see this last photo, but um, I'm certain if it's anything like I imagined, I'm sure it's a, a sort of like final thoughts section, um, allowing people to sort of um, take a breath and take a moment. I think a lot of the times when we're doing heavy emotional lifting, um, it can be a lot um, and it can bring up a lot. And so allowing ourselves a moment to pause is, is really where that's at. So yeah. Thank Thanks you so it. much. Ellie, I had a, a question for you. Um, uh, please feel free to, to answer in some questions in the chat if, you're, if the spirit moves you. Um, in the meantime, I just have a question for Ellie about your um, very sort of meditative um, um, piece. Just the way it describes, I talked a little bit about um, being able to, to, to be there and move through the landscape just by being in the text of this work and I and I definitely feel that. Um, I'm wondering if when I move to the land I look at birds primarily and um, if I notice anything else it's usually through the filter uh, they they kind of point me to different uh, hedges that they might fly into or different animals that they might interact with and so you you pay such keen um, attention to plants and their lives both above and below ground so I'm just wondering do the, do the plants ever urge you to pay attention to other parts of the landscape? Is there something that you might not consider to be your primary focus? What, like, where do the plants point you outside of the plant world? Sure, that's a great question. And I think it's such a good point that um, we often need a lens in order to be able to filter the landscape because there is so much. And for me, part of my methodology is putting on this plant lens, but thank goodness, I don't just see plants <laughs> when I do that, right? <laughs> right? And it allows me to to see how they're entangled. And I think 
Um, yeah, I mean, I'm always seeing multi-species connections. So, you know, I'm asking maybe will a pollinator visit that thistle plant, which is listed as a noxious and invasive plant, but the pollinator still likes it. And how do you think about that? Um, but certainly also, I think I like the scale of these kinds of plants. I mean, I'm, I engage with the eucalyptus as well, which is bigger and longer lived. But a lot of the time when I'm in the city, I'm dealing with these small herbaceous plants that might live for a season or two and require um, kind of scaling down your expectation for what you might be looking for in the landscape is. So I think um, part of what it does is just um, teach me to look for smaller details and to slow down my observation process. So like I, I've been spending, um, I'm, I didn't mention this in my bio, but um, I'm currently writing my dissertation in arts practice. And one of the ways I'm getting through that is setting a timer and going outside to hang out with my street tree <laughs> like twice a day or so. And in engaging every day with that street tree, I've come to notice that it has generations of staples put in its bark, which has led me to think about the fact that the city actually comes by and whenever they post a notice, they post it onto the street tree, which is actually really harmful to the tree and leads to the question of like, um, what are what are the layers that are left on plants that we might not catch if we don't stop and look carefully? And sometimes that's also that they're interacting with insects or with the soil in interesting ways. Where they grow can tell us a lot about what kinds of contaminants might be in the soil. Um, so there's all sorts of things I think that um, once you start to filter for plants allows you to kind of spread back out and and address a whole range. And it's just one filter. And there's many brilliant filters out there for this kind of work, um, but I can find that I can address pretty much all the ills that I want to um, confront in the world through wild and weedy plants and paying attention to them. So. Thank you. Um, we do have a question that we could uh, address to, to everybody, whoever might want to answer this one. How has creating a map, this is from Sophia, how has creating a map for the headlands affected the way that you look at and interact with other places in your life? Connie, you wanted to, I feel like I haven't heard from Connie, so I'm I heard. sure I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Um, thanks, you, Tunde. Um, yeah. Well, so I think the, I mean, making the map for the headlands was like a really, um, it was a really like generative um, invitation to, um, for me to start sort of cataloging or documenting my walks more. Um, with, you know, not just writing, but also drawing. And so I've, I've started making these sort of like little drawing. Yeah, like, like, a, like working in a similar vein of documenting some of the walks that I've been taking, um, which wasn't really a practice that I was in the habit of before. And, um, and I'm starting to see how wonderfully valuable that is. And so as an example, I recently um, made a, a map of um, like the sounds that I was hearing from a walk in my yard. And it was, um, and so it was, and it was, you know, it was just like little like drawing annotations marking the different sounds. And it was, uh, and it was very like, um, uh, yeah, it was, it was very like relational. And I think that's something that I, um, was inspired to do from making the map because it was such um, a productive process for me. I wanted to, to follow up on that question with you, Connie, about um, your reference to Robin Wall Kimmerer and um, her in the in the her book Braiding Sweetgrass. She she has a chapter on the language of animacy and talks about how how uh, her language Potawatomi is comprised of about. 70% verbs, whereas English is about 30% 30, 30 and, um, and then considers that nouning everything, using nouns is a way of, of making things static and classifying them and organizing them, whereas you have to contend with things if they're verbs because they have agency and they can, they live. And um, your, uh, your piece was really, I mean, one of the examples that she uses is, is the, a word for that means to be a bay. 
And, and going through your map, it really sort of reminded me of that passage because your descriptions of the landscape, of the fog, of other things were really um, uh, animating them and sort of giving them a kind of um, agency. And it's, it's a very sort of relational connection that you're getting across. So I was wondering if you were, um, like what kind of verbs do you, would you like us to, to take away from experiencing your map? Are there any, um, are there any things in the experience of looking at the map that you want to stress in terms of the, the beingness of the landscape? Yeah, um, thank you so much. And that really, yeah, is such a brilliant question and I'm really thankful you asked it. Um, the, yeah, I, I think, um, like, I mean, the, the sort of one of the main characters um, of the piece is the fog. And, um, and the other one is, you know, a, a, the seed that I'm trying to look for. But I think just thinking about the fog, I, um, I, I think about, I'm, yeah, I mean, when I think about like fog to fog as a verb, it's often used in, um, as a, a synonym for to occlude or to hide. But I also wonder if we can think about fog or to fog as um, a sort of in-between state of being able to be one thing or another because fog is, is essentially like a, the product of a cold and a warm front meeting and fog with a little more, with a little more pressure, a little more, um, you know, with like more air, you know, with more pressure in the air, it can actually just turn into vapor. With less pressure, it becomes rain. And so fog is sort of poised in this, you know, in this position to become more of a liquid or more of a gas. And, and I think that's an incredibly exciting and productive place to be. Um, I, I also, yeah, I mean, as you were asking that, I was thinking about how in Chinese, um, a lot of the characters there, I think there's about like 20,000 characters or something in total, which is insane. <laughs> um, but like a lot of characters can take on attributes of verbs, nouns, or adjectives. Um, and it really is dependent on the context. So like, for example, um, I mean, fog is, ooh, but fog, and that's usually used in um, the context of, a, of, of the noun fog. But um, there's a homonym, which is wu. Um, and it means, it can either mean like a task or it can mean to be engaged in. And that same character is actually also present in the character for fog. So in Chinese, the character for fog is made up of the characters to be engaged in and rain. And, and so like a lot of characters in Chinese are sort of building blocks of other um, words that could be a noun, could be an adjective, could be a verb, could be anything really. And so it's, yeah, it's all dependent on the context. And so like, and I think fog is like that too. And so are seeds, you know, like seed, a seed can be a verb with the right conditions, or it can be this static, um, or not, not static. I don't think seeds are ever really static, but it could be uh, the sort of what is seen as an, an inert object under different conditions, you know, in a packet. But if you add water, soil, it becomes a verb. Yeah, that's great. I feel like we, we fall into that category too. If we're well watered and fed, we have the right nutrients, we can become a verb as well. Um, there, do we have time for one more question or shall we? Um, okay, um, this is sort of relates. One is just an anecdote that I, as a raptor bander in the headlands, um, Connie, you're, you're talking about the fog and these multiple states. It also acts as a, as a forest edge in a way. We have excipiters, which are little uh, bird hunting uh, hawks that come that migrate through. And oftentimes when there's a fog bank, they will, um, they're known for hunting near the edges of forest, but they'll use the edge of the fog in much the same way. So their relationship to the fog is one, is, is almost mirrored in their relationship with the forest. It's really lovely to, to watch. Um, a question that we've received is, is a little bit about um, relationships and it's for all the artists. It's when you encounter each other's maps, 
do you find commonalities in terms of your experience of the space or are there uh, ways that each might extend or change your experience of the place the next time you're there? Yatunde, would you like to? Ah, oh, it's such a hard question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, reading the beginning of Ellie's um, and um, reading some of the, the sensibilities of Connie's, I think um, getting lost is something that I, I have, I'm like not directionally, I'm not directionally challenged. Like I, I'm, I, I, I uh, can walk through a space and I um, typically uh, remember my like nostalgic memory of all of these things. And I think that's something that is um, common throughout all of the ways that we're approaching ourselves in the space is being like, okay, what are, what's my memory of this particular tree or this particular plant or this particular patch of, of dirt? How does the weight of my foot hit this particular spot? And how does it relate to the rest of everything that's going on? And I think that there's a, um, there's a real attention to, um, whereas I feel like I might have been like, really about the self or about the human experience. I think there is a, um, in all of ours, a, a commitment to understanding the human experience in relationship to everything else that's going on. Um, and I think that that sensibility and that care within that um, um, is great um, and, and connects us all, I think. What do y'all think, though? <laughs> <laughs> I jumped in for a second. I feel like I'm I'm so longing for this landscape right now. Um, having I'm grew up in California and um, visited the headlands on and off, you know, since much before I became involved there as an artist. So um, I think I'm feeling this kind of longing to. Um, relive the map I made, but also I'm just, you know, reviewing Walter's map and then also seeing your two maps. Um, it's just so striking how many different ways there are to move through this landscape. And of course that's like, of obviously, but mm -hmm. seeing your photographs, Yuchinde, and then saying, I kind of saw that, but I totally didn't. I didn't think about squeezing my body into that nook, right? Or the way Connie moves up and through the fog. I know that walk, I maybe did it once, but it's not my habit, right? So I feel like something that's so beautiful about these maps is even though I haven't gotten to experience them in person, they're affecting me bodily already and making me want to have a different relationship. Let me actually giving myself goosebumps talking about it. <laughs> like I want to feel that fog. I want to like or what it's like to climb that rock face. So, um, and oh my goodness, I want to see those owls. But <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, I hope that that's, you know, something that everyone who engages with these maps um, can feel that pull to, to get onto land, even if it's not the headlands. Um, so mm -hmm. it, I think they're all offer something um, in terms of that embodied, cultivating a desire for embodiment. <laughs> Yeah, they're all this window into what's possible in a landscape. And I think it says something about the headlands that it's capable of holding each one of those portals of experience, each one of our maps fully. And still there's so much more depth and so much more possibility within, within that environment. Um, and I, I, it'll continue to support that, I think, for years to come, many artists to come, um, many residencies to come, and hopefully many administrations to come. That seems like the perfect ending to this amazing panel. Thank you, panelists. Uh, Connie, Sunday, Ellie, oh, so many insightful um, moments. I'm excited to walk back, walk the headlands now. I really hope and look forward to having each of you back here um, to, to do that walk. And Ellie, I'm sending a little bit of vibe to you as you work on your dissertation. Um, <laughs> I will uh, salute the plants for you. 
Um, I also just want to thank the entire audience for joining us today. Um, and please, you know, if you're in the Bay Area or near the Bay Area, please come and visit us. The, you know, we are, I mean, I know this is a, a, a very precarious time, but it is very possible to do these walks and explore this landscape in a socially distant way. And for those who are not as close, uh, we look forward to welcoming you um, uh, when, when we soon, very soon, I hope, um, uh, uh, when we reopen. Walter, thank you for moderating this uh, wonderful conversation. Carrie, I, 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 I believe that you're on and I just wanna thank you for um, this, this the installation and just uh, the key room and just uh, thank you for the inspiration for this conversation, the ongoing engagement at Headlands. And on that note, thank you very much. Have a good rest of your day, everyone. Thank you. Bye.